Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hello, everybody. My name is Al, and I'm an alcoholic. Of course, I'm a cured alcoholic because I'm cured so long as I don't take a drink, they say. Cured physically, anyway. <laughs> but I've been drunk mentally many, many times, believe me. Uh, the, he was talking about the airport down there. I have to tell you this. How ding a you get. I don't care how long you've been sober. You're still nuts sometimes. You know? But uh, I'm very sophisticated. I ride the planes a lot, you know, and uh, I don't worry about whether I'm going to get on at the right time. So the old plane I could get up here was left at 8.50 this morning down there. 8.45, I'm sorry. And then the only one I can go back on from here is that damn United uh, Airlines. I was going to say United Artists. <laughs> uh, at uh, 8.50 in the morning. So I'm kind of cussing in my beer. I said, boy, this is rough. Uh, I have to get up so early to go up there. So I got off to the airport. And they, they have a new port, you know. It's uh, you know, United Airlines has built their own building, and it's quite a ways away from the old airport now. But uh, I got out there all right, and they have big TV screens that tell you the changes and the number of the plane and the changes in time and one thing. Another log did it. It says 8.45. It said 9 o'clock. So I went up to gate 78, and I sat down, got myself a magazine and the morning paper, had breakfast, sat down, and uh, 9 o'clock, and then I look up at the board again, it says 9.10. Well, 9.10. So I said, well, this damn plane's never going to get out of here, you know. So then I look at the board again, it's 9.20. And uh, then the last time I looked at the board, it was 9.40. So I'm sitting there reading the paper, and I figured, well, it'll go out about maybe 10 or 10.30. No use getting excited. <laughs> About 9.50, I looked up there, and the plane isn't on the board anymore, see? <laughs> so I went over to gate 78, and I said, uh, when does this damn 372 leave? He says, well, it left 10 minutes ago. He said, <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I call up downstairs. Now they got it fixed up there. They have white telephones you can get information on all around the place. So I picked up a white telephone, and I said, I missed my plane. I'm sitting right here. Nobody announced the plane. He says, we announced it three times. I'm sorry. So I said, well, uh, what will I do? And he says, well, there's a Pacific Airlines. goes to Monterey. It's just a few miles from there. Maybe you can make arrangements on that. So I have to get a cab again, and I have to go over to Pacific, and then I sit there until 1220. Anyway, I'm a ding -a I admit it. I know it. <laughs> and I call up my wife and I says, she says, well, what are you calling me from Salinas for? I says, honey, I'm still at the airport. <laughs> he says, you need a keeper. I said, that's right, I need a keeper. You know, a very dear friend of ours down there who's been in AA about 16, 18 years, he's getting so forgetful. Of course, he'd be this way whether he was a drunk or not that he'll drive up and park his car in the middle of the street and walk into his apartment and he can't find his own apartment. Of course, now they have him in a hospital. He's an actor, and uh, actors are a little nuts, too, you know. <laughs> but uh, she says, well, you're getting as bad as Frank. I says, I'm worse than Frank. They're going to put me in the hospital when I get back. But it's a nice story. It's a lot of laughs now, but I was mad then. I was very angry. Lost my serenity and my humility went right out the window, you know, what I had left of it. Like the story that I was telling at a, the last group I spoke at about a week ago, and I forgot the punchline. You know, it's, it's funny to just tell a story and get there, and I said, my God, I forgot the punchline, and I got a better laugh out of that than I ever did when I remember the punchline. <laughs> this fellow was uh, the sort of a guy that would get drunk and he'd go out on the highway and, and drive like crazy. He was an electrician at one of the studios down there, and he was around these people all the time. He went out this particular night, and he's going about 90, 100 miles an hour out on the highway, and he comes to a fast curve, and he doesn't make the curve, and he went over the hill, and he rolled over about six times, and he ended up on his wheels. Lucky, like all alcoholics, eh? And uh, didn't get hurt a bit. And he got out of the car, and he was standing, leaning against the car, kind of weaving around, and here come a highway cop come along, and he put his flashlight on his face, looked at him in a minute, and he says, my God, man, you're drunk. 
He says, well, certainly I'm drunk. Do you think I'm a stunt man? <laughs> you don't like that? <laughs> I think that's a very good joke. But I got to that place and I forgot. The, the, the guy says, well, what do you think I am? Uh? And I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> so you see, you get senile even though sober. And then there was another joke I heard the other day. This uh, this old uh, Irishman, old Pat O'Brien, he had uh, he had taken the pledge from this priest many, many times, and uh, he'd go out and get drunk again. One time, this uh, good priest was walking down the street, and he sees a body laying in the gutter, face up, and here it's O'Brien. And he said, he literally looks just like he's dead. He doesn't even look like he's breathing. His eyes are closed. So the father reached over and shook the body a little bit, and O'Brien opened his eyes, and the father says, And my good man, what got you into this condition? He says, Three fathers, Feather. <laughs> That's an old one, but I like it. <laughs> Now that we're going so good and I've got to 11 o'clock, I'll tell you no. <laughs> but this is a little rough, I mean, it's a little subtle. I was a practicing musician for 40 years. I blew a trombone and uh, various instruments. <laughs> I ended up on the trombone because there weren't so many good trombone players. So that, that made <laughs> less competition, you know. Anyway, these musician stories kind of kill me. Uh, this particular one is rather funny, I think. This guy, uh, there was a place uh, down there when we worked studios, there's uh, RKO and Paramount are close to each other, and there was a, a beer joint, a watering place, they call it, you know, the high, high class word is a watering place now, you read in these magazines, the watering place. The watering place for all the drunken musicians was the Melrose Grotto, you know, <laughs> we kept that place, we made that guy a millionaire, I want to tell you, and they happened to be playing a date at R Paramount, and uh, we were playing a date at RKO where I was working in all of us crowded in there about the same time, about 6 o'clock. You could always tell the normal drinkers they'd have two and they'd go home. But the rest of us didn't go home. We had two and then we stayed and forgot to eat and we'd get kicked out at 2 o'clock in the morning. Even during Prohibition, <laughs> this guy would serve us over that bar. It was really good. He was paying a lot of protection, I guess. Anyway, there was a little piano player. He was about so high and he was a wonderful piano player, but he used to go on these terrible, terrible drunks. There's such people I never heard, you know. And, <laughs> and uh, this particular night, why uh, we're all sitting around the bar there, and here comes old Itchy in, and he pulls himself up on the stool. And my God, he's been on one of these drunks again. His whiskers are down to here. He's puked all over himself, and he come out from under the rocks, you know. And, and uh, he was in terrible, terrible shape. And he sat up there, and he was a sweet little guy when he was sober, but he's in bad shape, and he kept beating on the bar. He says, John, give me a drink. I'm the best damn piano player in the world. I could play anything. I could play anything. John, give me a drink. Well, finally, one of the musicians got a little bit intolerant, and he says, you're so wonderful. Go over there and play that piano. Let's hear you play. He says, I'll just show you. And he skidded off the stool and started for the piano, and lo and behold, the seat of his pants were off, and his fanny was hanging out. <laughs> And the bartender noticed this just as the guy started for the piano, and he rushed over there, and just as Itchy sat down, he says, Do you know your fanny's hanging out? And Itchy says, No, but just whistle a few bars, and I'll follow you. <laughs> That's the damnedest I ever heard that one, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, we can go on and on. I was thinking a lot of funny stories today. And, you know, there's so many people take this AA. I mean, we're serious about Alcoholics Anonymous. All of us are. If we aren't serious, we aren't going to stay sober. And uh, AA is no place for a guy who hasn't made up his mind that they want to stay sober. I don't like to say in the old days, but when I came in in 41, I was asked, do you want to stay sober on an all-time basis? And I said, yeah. He says, okay, sit down. If you don't want to stay sober on an all-time basis and you got an idea here in the back of your head that you want to drink again, get the hell out of here and come back when you can qualify. 
He says, the door will be open and you can come back. But we don't want to waste time on people who haven't made the decision that they want to stay sober. If you just want to want to stay sober, go ahead and get out. Because we've got a lot of calls to make, we've got a lot of people to try to help, and we don't want somebody that isn't serious about this thing. And, and you know, the average in those days was a way above what it is now, because it was real tough. I never heard in those days we stay sober on a day-to-day -day basis, but my God, if it keeps you sober, that's great. I never heard of that until I'd been sober at least five years. There were a lot of things that I didn't hear in those days. We never gave away cakes for birthdays in those days. In fact, there's mostly all of you down south. I don't know how you are up here. There's a lot of things that have come into AA since that time. I don't know whether it's good or not, whether it's bad. If standing on your head for an hour from 12 to 1 every noon keeps you sober, that's the place for you. If that is going to do the job, that is the deal. And that is the estimation of everybody in AA, naturally. Whatever helps you and keeps you sober, that's the thing. But this is a serious proposition. But as I say, I like a lot of laughs. I cried, and I puked, and I prayed, and I laid in bed and killed, and, well, damn near died many, many times. I never went to a sanitarium in my life, thank God, because I think it drove me into AA a lot faster. If I could have found a way to get over that hangover easier, I wouldn't have come in when I did at the age of 38. I know that very well. In fact, I was so naive about this thing, I didn't even know that you could go to a doctor and get a shot. I thought that this was standard equipment, that everybody practically died getting over a two or three or four week drunk. In fact, it was many years before I went on that long a drunk. And that was good. I'm not putting myself up on a pedestal as being the ideal by a long ways. But I got it the hard way and it was the best thing for me. Unfortunately, I thought a lot of people die before they do give up and say, I would rather be sober than anything else in the world. And my idea of drunks were people down on Skid Row. When I got on a bender, I stayed as far away from Skid Row as possible for fear I would end up down on Skid Row, which I would have eventually, there's no doubt. But do you know that just 3% of the alcoholics are on Skid Row? The rest of us are from the Skid Row on up. And we have less success with the boys in Skid Row than we do with any other department of the human race. The idea of the public in general is that uh, if you're an alcoholic, it's a nasty word, and you're laying down there behind a signboard, which is very, very silly. But I like lots of laughs. I don't believe in going around with my head between my knees and saying, oh, my God, thank you, oh, my God, thank you, oh, my God, thank you. I can think, thank God by helping other people, I think, more than in any other way in the world. And I have so many people, and you have so many people. Of course, I've been around a long time, and I know an awful lot of people in AA. And this is my life. This is my avocation. I made, it, made up my mind when I came into AA that if I was ever called on at any time to do anything, if it was humanly possible, I would do it, so long as it wouldn't injure my health. And that is running out and talking every night, which I don't do anymore. Once a week is it, because I'm getting old. My God, 38. You see, I'm 59 now. <laughs> but crazy as ever. It does make it. I have a ball all the time. So my life is in AA, outside of my business and putting hamburger on the table, which is the most important so long as I'm sober. From there on, it's Alcoholics Anonymous. My wife just mentioned the other night, she says, you know, we ought to go down and see My Fair Lady or some of these wonderful shows. I says, well, I've been saying that for the last five years, but you say, well, let's go to an AA meeting instead. I want to see so-and-so. So she's just as nuts as I am about this business, you see. Ha, 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 ha. It's a crazy business. I had people call me up and say, I had a slip. I said, what do you call me for? Well, I, I thought maybe you could help. I said, what help can I give you? You know as much about as AA as I did. Well, I haven't been along, around as long as you have. I says, if you've been around two weeks, you know just as much about AA as I do. There's no secrets in this thing. You've got the book, that's where I got it. You go to meetings, that's where I got it. You talk to people, that's where I got it. So there isn't anything that I could do for you. Why should I come over to hold your head while you puke? You can go get a nurse to do that, you know. <laughs> and it's the truth. So they'll say, well, I'll tell you, I uh, I didn't get, uh, uh, I'll say, well, what do you think made you get drunk? It's always something different, but they always come back to uh, two, one of two things. They say, uh, Al, I didn't get the spiritual side of the program. Well, now here's something that's uh, sort of controversial. Which side is the spiritual side? 
what is the spiritual side? Well, they had no answer. I say, well, what is the spiritual side of the program that you didn't get? Well, God, I says, well, what's God got to do with this? I mean, God is spiritual, that's true. But I, did you ever stop to consider the whole program? Isn't that spiritual? Yes, by golly, it's come to come to think of it as spiritual. I say, anything that is positive and that does you good and helps you and makes you happy, therefore making everybody around you happy, must be a spiritual thing. Yeah. Well, now, where's the side of the deal? Well, I, I, I have become an agnostic. This comes back at you every once in a while. Well, it says keep an open mind. Is that going to worry you? No. I know guys in AA that I know one fellow in particular. Four years he was around here. Four years. He wouldn't recite the Lord's Prayer. He was an atheist, and he was an honest atheist, and I admired him for it. And he could argue me into the corner any time he wanted to about uh, about the religion or God or anything like that. And I'd say, well, I have faith. That's as far as I can go with you. He was around for four years, this particular man. and didn't believe in God and was honest about it. But he kept an open mind. He kept an open mind. So I hadn't seen this particular person for quite a while. We happened to be talking at a group together one night. And he got up and he says, God this and God that and God will do this for you and God will do that for you. So on the way home I said, Jim, how come? You're talking about God, God, God. Well, he said, you fellas said to keep an open mind. And I finally, finally got through my thick skull that I wasn't doing this job all alone. That there must be something greater and more powerful outside of me that was helping me. So he says, this is my God. And my conception maybe is much different than your conception. But I do believe in a power greater than myself. I believe that there's a, there is a great, great mind, a great spirit of some kind that is helping me. And that's my God. So you see, this is something that we hear so much about that there are so few know anything about. Just don't worry about it. It says in the book, don't worry about it. My conception of God and a power greater than myself has changed completely from the time that I was... Uh, a non-alcoholic, <laughs> is that possible, <laughs> uh, into being a real true alcoholic and an Alcoholics Anonymous. I have absolute faith. I say that everything that happens to me happens for the best. And things that happen to me that I don't like very well and I dislike and make me uncomfortable, usually there's a reason for it. Just like missing the plane today, there was a reason for me to miss that plane. Why, I don't know. But it will come out eventually. And through my life, as I look back in res retrospect, since I've been an AA, previous to AA, I never thought of these things. I can see so many times. I wanted something real badly. I wanted something to happen real badly. I would work towards that end like a demon, like an eager beaver, and it wouldn't happen. And then maybe six months later, I would look back, and I'd see where if I had had this event happen, it would have been a catastrophe to me. And this has happened many times in my AA life. I think that if I try to live the kind of life that is laid down in the book of Alcoholics Anonymous, which is a spiritual way of life, which is a good way of life, that everything that happens to me will happen for the best, whether I believe it or not at the time. It always does. It always does. The first year I was sober, I had been a very, making very good money in the studios. Of course, it was dwindling off kind of fast. But the first year I was sober, I made less money than I had since I was a high school kid. I couldn't understand why. Everything was upside down. I made $1,400. They took my old beat up car away from me. Everything was upside down. And you know what happened? I cussed everybody and everything. Here I am sober. Five months, six months, eight months, ten months, a year. What's the matter? They say, there's a God, why doesn't he help me? I'm sober now, now's the time that I should be getting some good out of this AA. Nothing happened. After about two or three years in AA, I looked back at that first year. And you know why I didn't get any work then? Because God was taking care of me. For some power greater than myself, or call it anything that you want. I had been going to those studios for at least ten years, always with a fifth of booze or something, the, the equivalent thereof. <laughs> I had gotten to the point where I had lost confidence in myself when I had something real tough to play. And believe me, studio music is the toughest in the world, and you read it at sight and you play it right now. And I'd get the buck and I'd get nervous. And being an alcoholic and a big shot, I had to be the first trombone player and kill myself. 
So I just got jumped behind the stand and I'd have myself a couple of very fast snorts, or maybe three or four. I'd get that false courage from the booze, and a lot of you have been through it. And I'd get up there and play. Maybe not too good, but I'd get over it. You see, I'd get over those shakes. And this habit pattern had been with me for so many years that God didn't allow me to get into this predicament for a long, long time after I got sober on AA. And I believe this absolutely as honest as I'm standing here before you tonight. And this is just one example. If I do the best job I, I can, with all the honesty that I can muster, to live this kind of a life and be as honest and true and treat others like I want to be treated, and practice these steps of Alcoholics Anonymous as they're laid down here, no harm can come. This I absolutely believe. I kicked around an awful lot after I got into AA. This job and that wild job, of course, music was always in the background. And it hasn't been a lot for the last three years, financially, that I have been able to really get rolling financially. But I always said, as I have told many of my friends personally, I said, don't worry, you are going to have everything happen to you that is for good. You'll get everything in this life that you deserve if you just try to live this kind of life. And it works out. It works out beautifully. Now this disease of alcoholism, and let's get down to this disease. I know that many times I'm very boring when I talk. But there's only one way that I can talk. I don't give an awful lot of my own life's history because what the who wants that? Well, that's it, you know. We're all a bunch of drunks, some worse and some better. And our experiences are practically the same. And I can stand up here and give you a blow-by-blow -blow description, but what good is it going to do you or me? I think the best thing that I can do with you and me is tell you how I think I am trying to stay sober, which I believe honestly that this is the way I am trying to stay sober and is working for me. And when I hear you talk, if you will get up here and say, I am trying to stay sober this way, this way, and this way, you are going to do me a lot of good because I'll learn something from you and maybe cast away an idea that I had and grab your conception. And this is the way it works. We're all different kind of people. We're all different kind of drunks. We all think different. But honesty is something that is exactly the same for all of us, the foundation, the basis of alcoholics and honor. But this disease is made up of an allergy of the body coupled with an obsession of the mind. And this is as true as I'm standing here also. And whether you develop the allergy or whatever happens, I know it isn't the excess use of booze that causes the allergy. It just so happens that 4% of the people in the world will become allergic to alcohol if they drink at all. I know guys that are half pinters, you know. Ha, ha, ha. Why, not enough to put in my hollow tooth. <laughs> And they become alcoholics from drinking a half a pint a day or something like that. Well, they're, they're, they're physically, they become allergic, or they have a biological or a chemical change, just like you and me have had, whereby they're unable to catalyze alcohol. And this is something that is the incurable part of the program. When Bill says in the book Alcoholics Anonymous, we have crossed a line, whereby we will never be able to return to normal drinking or happy drinking again, I believe it's this line where we have this physical change which is biological or chemical. And the doctor told me it's an amazing thing, but you alcoholics don't even absorb alcohol into your tissues like so-called normal people. I said, why? He says, no one knows. Why does a person become a diabetic? <coughs> well, nobody knows. They still haven't got the cure for it. You take the insulin, which is not a cure, as soon as you take the insulin away, why the person goes into a coma if they eat any, anything at all. And the same is very true of the of alcoholism and the alcoholic body. We don't catalyze alcohol like normal people. Therefore, it stays in our bloodstream and hits our brain, and we become real ding -ling. The change, the change in personality. How many times have you been told, man, you're like a Jekyll and Hyde? Ha, 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 ha. You're a SB when you get drunk. You're terrible, you know? <laughs> you're a small guy when you're sober, but boy, when you're drunk. Oh, man, I don't want to be around you. I've gotten that so many times. On the other side of the picture is this obsession. How this thing develops, it develops faster with some, or less fast with others. But if, if that gal next door, who lived in that house next door to me, could take a jug and drink a fifth and not be falling down, and I couldn't, man, this was something. I was going to learn to drink like her. Or I was going to learn to drink like this other guy. Or I was going to learn to drink again like I used to when I was 20, 24 years old. I drank normally for many years. I didn't have any trouble with booze. Never lost any jobs, none of that stuff. I used to have the jitters a little bit, but I always ate breakfast. I'd get my trombone out and I'd practice and I'd go to work and that was it. 
maybe shake my head a little until noon after I'd had lunch. There was no more trouble. I remember years of this kind of drinking. And I remember the guys that I used to play with in bands. And some of them I would say, man, you're just a lousy drunk. You're, you're, you're headed for skid roll. And those guys quit, and I kept on, and I become an alcoholic. It's the damnedest thing I ever saw. I am one of those. Four percent of the people in the world who would become an alcoholic if I drank booze to any degree at all. But I don't think the mental part of this is so important as the physical. Myself. I hear so many people get up and say, I'm an alcoholic because my dad and mother were divorced when I was eight years old. Well, I know millions of guys whose mothers and dad were divorced when they were eight years old, and they're not alcoholic. And the other guy says, my mother had dropped me on my head when I was uh, ten years old, so I'm an alcoholic. All kinds of damned excuses, you know. And you really don't have to have an excuse because this is a, is a disease. Is it your mother's fault because you have to uh, have heart trouble or you uh, broke your leg or <laughs> anything else that you can dig up? You see, we're looking for excuses. The truth of the thing is that if you and I drank at all, we would have become alcoholic. Now, I have a friend in a group down in Los Angeles. He's a pretty big shot in Los Angeles. He comes to Arlington. He never took a drink of alcohol until he was 45 years old. Had never taken a drink of alcohol in any form until he was 45 years old. But now he was a big success. He's making $150,000 a year at a big institution down there. So he decided now he was going to try drinking. Now he was a success. He was going to try drinking. Within five years, he's a hopeless alcoholic. You see? He was potentially an alcoholic all the time. This physical was right there, right from the very start. As soon as he started drinking, it come right out. So you see, it doesn't make a damn bit of difference. So what do we do about this obsession, this compulsive drinking? This is where AA comes in. This is where we have to change our attitudes. We have to change our personality. We have to change our thinking. This is what, what has happened to us. We've got our, our thinking all wound up. It's all a bunch of knots, you know. It's just like the guy that I heard describe this. <clears throat> he says, we AAs are like the guy who went fishing. And he got his fish line all tied up into a bunch of knots. Now he says we're starting to un undo those knots in AA. He says, and this takes a lifetime. <laughs> and he says, we undo one and then we undo another. And he says, it just keeps on going just like us practicing these steps of alcoholics anonymous and trying to work them out so that we can get our minds straightened out and we start thinking right. We get our attitudes straightened out, our personalities. But he says, we'll always leave a few little knots in this fish line, you know. <laughs> Because, you know, it says, we grow spiritually, we never become perfect. And that's just the same as this guy. Oh, try to get these knots out of the fish line. There's just a few of them in there that he'll never get out. So I'm a little ding -a -ling. I'm a happy ding -a -ling, though. You know, this is very important, too. <laughs> like the guy who, uh, this, this uh, doctor had the uh, sanitarium for uh, mental cases. And uh, he was a psychiatrist. And he was taking in a lot of cases for the county and the state. And there were a lot of these guys who were freeloading on him. In other words, they were wild and they should be on the street. And they do little things so they could stay there longer and freeload. So this day he came to work and he says, I'm going to get through the rid of these freeloaders and get them back on the street so I can bring in some more patients. So he called them into his office two at a time. And he sat one there and he sat one there. And he says to this guy, he said, what does this remind you of? And the guy says, the hole in the donut. He says, you're well, you're on the street. Said the other guy, <laughs> said the other guy, he says, what does that remind you of? And the guy said, Thursday. He said, Thursday, how do you get Thursday out of that? The guy says, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. <laughs> I got a lot more of those. <laughs> And then there, there's uh, these obsessions, the obsession to drink, the compulsion to drink. Uh, who knows how this thing developed? I know with me, I, I remember back when I used to go on a jazz band I was working with, especially this, this brings me back to Chicago. We used to have a party about every month, the whole band together. We used to get drunk as lords, and we uh, someone would be fined if they got come late to work and all, we take all this fine money and we put it in one little bundle and we buy ourselves a, a joint for the night and we'd have a ball and everybody get drunk. 
And I remember that the guys would tell me the next day when I'd come to work, and this hadn't happened before, they said, boy, did you make an ass of yourself last night? Well, now, to most people, this wouldn't bother them a great deal. But we alcoholics, there's something about us, we are much more sensitive than most people. Now, you can call this good or you can call it bad, but we are. And things hurt us. We might not say anything about it. And that old man remorse would set in. And I'd get to worrying about, well, what did I do last night that was so terrible? And now I'll try to think of what happened last night, and there was a blackout in there somewhere along the line. And then I remembered when I got up in the morning, I went and looked out of the window to see if my car was parked in front of my apartment or not. This is not normal. This is very abnormal. This is bad drinking. This is alcoholism. This is what it is. When we start getting to that point where we can't remember what we did, or where we were last night, or how we got home, we've got trouble. Unless we can quit drinking right now, we've got trouble. Because if we continue at all, we're going to, it's going to get worse. It never gets better. It never gets better if we keep on. So this is what happened. And then I used to get so damn remorseful about these things and so worried, I'd have to go and have a couple snorts to kind of escape from this, you know, the old escape process that we all went through. And then this thing got worse. So when I had a few snorts, then I got just as drunk that day. Maybe not as drunk, but I'd be drunk during the day. That night, I'd go on another real bad one. And this continued, and these things went on and on and on and on. To the point where when anything would happen, which would get me emotionally upset to any degree at all, and don't forget we become very emotionally unstable, I had to have a drink. I had to have a drink. I would become so emotionally upset and so uncomfortable that it was actually physical pain. And I know that you went through the same thing. Maybe you never thought of it in this life, but I did. It was actually physical pain, and the only way that I could get rid of this pain was to have myself a snort. And then it got to the point where no matter what happened, people were talking about me. They didn't appreciate me. I would dig up the damnedest things to worry about in spite of myself not wanting to. And I don't know, we have an ability to magnify nothing into something better than any class of people in the world. And we are a class of people. Something would happen. Maybe I had a date, maybe I was working at a certain studio, and I taught a great deal. I taught at the Los Angeles Conservatory down there, which is not too important to you, but to me it was. And I had some very wonderful students, and I gave them everything I had. And I worked real hard with them, and I made a lot of money on them, I can't deny that. And here I... One day, one of my students has taken my place at one of my first call studios. What's the matter? I knew what the matter was down deep in my heart. I hadn't been putting out a good job for somebody. One of the leaders there told me out. He says, the most dependable thing about you is your independability. <laughs> <laughs> and this would say, I'd say, well, the guy's a good trombone player. I, I can say with pride that I've taught him to play. He's a wonderful musician. He deserves a break. But down deep in my heart, oh, how I resented this. Oh, God, how I resented it. One of my students taking a job away from me as a student become first call man where I had been for so many years. And you know, this thing would just keep building up in my mind and keep building up in my mind. And this is just one instance I'm telling you about to the point that pretty soon I was emotionally just snapping at everybody and wanting nothing to do with anybody and getting away with everybody and my own wife. That was the first one. Don't forget the intolerant one I was married to first, you know. She'd say, <laughs> she'd say, God, I wish you'd take a drink. And here I was on the wagon, you see. And eventually, I got to the point where I had to go across the street for that snort, knowing full well that within a day or two, I was going to be on another real blast and just praying to God that I came off of this alive and all in one piece. To walk through hell again is what it actually was. While I was drunk, it didn't make any difference, but getting sober, man, this was something. I asked the doctor about that one day, and he says, when you're coming off of one of those bad drunks, it's a slight case of dementia praecox. Ha, ha! In other words, I was a real dame. <laughs> so these are the things that I went through, and I think these are the things that you went through, too. Because I tried to stay sober with every fiber in my body for a long time before AA came along. And one time I made it for three months. But I was the most unhappy human being in the world. I hated everybody. And here's these other guys could drink and I couldn't drink. What I was giving up, oh, Dad, this was something. I was giving up the very, well, life itself and all the laughs that I would ever have again when I gave up food. And then I came into AA and I found out all the other day. I found out I never did have any laughs till I came to AA. It's, it's, it's everything funny. When guys get up and talk, you know, I mean, 
Maybe I've got a screwed up sense of humor, but guys get up and talk and say, my wife, she's the cause of me being drunk. I just have to say, ha, 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 this is wonderful. Or that boss of mine, man, he, I just, well, I resent him. Ah, oh, I just rear back and I have to laugh, and I'm a damn fool. Because I've heard this so many times and said it so many times myself, it's real funny. It is real funny. I says, if your wife causes you to get drunk, divorce her. If your boss causes you to get drunk, quit the damn job. The most important thing for you in the world is to stay sober, or you're going to be dead, or you're going to be down in Camarilla permanently. That's all. So this is the truth. This is the most important thing in my life is my sobriety. This is the most important thing. Because without sobriety, I'm in an insane asylum, or I'm dead. One of the two. I'm six foot under. And this little piano player that was played at this nightclub, he was playing at a piano bar. It's another musician story. Brings me up to that, six foot under. So he was a lush, he was a drunk, and he got himself a job in a piano bar. And he found himself a room close by because he didn't have the price of an automobile. And he found that he could get to his room by walking through a cemetery, a small cemetery, and following this path through here to this room. Well, this goes on for about two months. And everything goes fine. No matter how drunk he is, he can follow this path through this thing. But one night he's real loaded, as usual. But this night he lost his way off this path, and he fell in the hole that was dug for a funeral the next day. And the little guy is just about five foot high. He's got his tuxedo on, and he's down at the bottom of this hole, and he can't reach the top, and he's screaming all night, Get me out of here. I'm freezing to death. I'm freezing to death. Well, you know, nobody heard him. And about dawn, an old wino come wandering through this cemetery. And he hears this guy screaming, and he went over there, and here's this guy laying on his back at the bottom of the hole, all spread eagled out. And he says, what's the matter down there, pal? And the guy says, get me out of here, I'm freezing to death. Get me out of here, I'm freezing to death. And the old wino looked at him a minute, and he says, no wonder you're freezing to death. You've kicked all your dirt off. <laughs> from a drunk. Uh, his bedroom was on the street and my bedroom was on the street. And uh, this, <laughs> this guy's name was Jack. He was one of the finest musicians I ever met in my life. He had perfect pitch. Well, you know, God just gives one out of every 10,000 people perfect pitch. In other words, you could whistle, you could yell, you could do anything, and he'd tell you what note you were yelling, and he, you could hit a bunch of notes on the piano, and he'd name right off. This is a gift, you know. You can develop it, but you never get it perfect like one of these guys. He was a fine arranger. He was a fine composer. He did a lot of work in studios. He made big money in his day. He was an agnostic or an atheist. We used to get drunk together. We used to argue about whether there's a God, not a God. You know, those, those light things that drunks always argue about, politics and religion and stuff. You know how we are. And he used to put me down all the time. He studied this stuff real deep. And Jack and I had a little AA club all our own. All our own. We used to help one another. Two drunks helping one another. <laughs> I'm dying in the morning. I mean, I've been on a real bad bender. I just moved my head and I puked. And I, uh, my heart is up in my throat. And I'm dying and I can't reach over even to tie my shoes without falling right on my nose. So I yelled through the window, Jackson, Jackson, Jackson. And he'd say, what is it, Chief? And I'd say... Make the run. Make the run. So within a half hour, Jack would be over at my house with a bottle, and I'd have myself a few snorts, and pretty soon I was up and able to tie my shoes and get out, which usually I'd start out on another drunk. I did the same thing for Jack, only Jack was a very low-type drinker. He was a bed drinker. I looked down my nose. I says, if I drank like you, I'd quit, you know? <laughs> He'd yell, chief, 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 and I'd say, what is it? He'd make the run. So I'd go get him a chuck and beg for a steel, and I'd get it over to him. But he was a very odd drinker. I'd always have to grab the dish pan when I went through the kitchen so he could puke, you know? He'd puke, puke all the time. And... Uh, but he'd stay in bed. As long as he had a jug, or as long as he could keep knocked out, he'd stay in bed, put the curtains down, you know, I mean, this is real, this is real crazy drinking. And I'd say, Jack, this is no way to drink. 
He says, well, he says, uh, I don't get pinched as often as you do. <laughs> Jack was a real wonderful guy. I mean, he was a, uh, basically he was a real fine guy and one of the finest salesmen with one of the finest minds that I'd ever met in my life. Now, down around the corner, there was old Sam. Sam was an old Jewish fellow that had a beautiful, beautiful liquor store. I mean, one of the best. And Sam was a real guy. He'd put you on the cup once in a while, once in a while. And uh, old Jack, he was such a salesman that he got Sam up to $500 that he owed him. Now, this is over a matter of years. So this particular day, Jack wants a jug real bad, and I'm dying for a drink. So he says, let's go down and see old Sam. And I says, you old poor old Sam, 500 bucks now, Jack, you got no chance. He says, let's take a whirl at it. It ain't going to cost nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so we went down, and he said, Sam, I want a fifth of old granddad, or whatever it was. And uh, Sam says, money? He says, no. He says, oh, you put this on the cuff, Sam. And Sam says, I can't put it on the cuff. Jack, you owe me 500 bucks now. And Jack says, well, I'll pay. He says, I got a big deal over at Plumpy. He says, 15 minutes of minutes of music. He says, I got about $5,000 worth of work. And he says, I'll pay your whole 5000 or 500 Sam says, yeah. He says, you got me up to 200 and you paid me 100 You got me up to 300 you paid me 50 Now you got me up to 500 And he says, Jack, I need that money real bad right now. Jack says, I ain't got it, Sam. I just want a job. He says, uh, Jack, go out and borrow. Jack says, I can't borrow 500 He says, hawk your instruments. He says, they're in hawk already. Well, it went on and on, and finally Sam says, go to the bank and borrow. And Jack says, uh, you mean on a personal note? And Sam says, yeah. And he says, well, I need a cosigner. And Sam says, I'll cosign. <laughs> <laughs> so we got our job. <laughs> Sam paid back $500, 12 equal monthly payments, 6% interest. <laughs> So you can see how I admired this fellow Jack. He was the greatest. Uh, bring him up a little later. Anyway, <clears throat> I come from a family of ten kids. I'm the only alcoholic in the bunch. The only one. Now, some people say we were raised on the same wrong diet. You know, we were all raised on the same diet. We had, they say you, were, you had the wrong environment. That's the reason you're an alcoholic. We all had the same environment. We all went to the same schools and had the same teachers from the first grade on up. And I'm the only alcoholic in the whole crowd. It's strange, you know, my brother says, Marino, you just don't have the willpower. My own brother says, you haven't got the willpower. Isn't it strange? They, they'll never get it in their stupid heads that I'm, I'm allergic to alcohol. Well, anyway, <clears throat> I, uh, I tried the cure. That's the puking cure, you know. <laughs> Now, any of you who have never tried it, don't. There really ought to be a law against it. When I say that, I mean it. I'm serious about it. Although I'm laughing, I'm serious about it. Because I just puked for four days and four nights. They give you all the booze you want to drink. And then they shoot that apple morphine in your chest, which makes you sick. And you're supposed to believe it's the booze that makes you vomit. And then you just puke. And then they give you those real high animals. And I mean high animals. <laughs> Too long. And then they give you the sweat pills and you perspire right through the mattress. Well, one guy was in the same room with me, died. He died of a heart attack. I said, isn't this something, though? You know, here I am puking and the guy's dying. <laughs> and it cost $150, which I never got quite all of it paid in. And after I got out of that, after four days and four nights, the guy says, don't drink anymore. Don't ever take a drink. I says, is that all you got to say? He says, yeah. Well, I says, whatever. Get this apple morphine out of my system. I'll be able to drink again. He says, well, that isn't it. I says, this is fine for kids, but it's not fine for an old billiard drinker like me. When I got out, I saw a friend of mine, and he says, you know what they did to you down there? And I says, no. He says, they put you through the ringer and hung you up on the line. <laughs> they charged you $150 more. <laughs> so it's just no good. All of these things are no good. It all has to be up here. We have to make up our minds. We have to do something about all these things. So, then I took psychiatric treatment. Now, I had a dingling musician friend from Chicago who was going to a psychiatrist because he went nuts on booze. 
And they let him out of this nut house in New York, and he had an insurance policy whereby he got $100 a week as long as he was incapable of holding a job. And while he was in Los Angeles, he went to a psychiatrist to prove that he was nuts. So he'd get this $100 a week, see? <laughs> this is the truth, you see. So long as he was nuts, they had to pay him $100 a week. Because if he wasn't nuts, then he had to go back to work. <laughs> he's, uh, he's still nuts. <laughs> but uh, he told me about this guy, and I was having a lot of trouble with my booze, and he knew it. He was a real fine guy. So I went to this fellow, and he didn't speak good English, so he was a good psychiatrist. You speak broken English, why, then you're a better psychiatrist. Yeah. And after four treatments, I gave up because I wasn't serious. I, I, I really didn't do what the guy wanted me to. He wanted me to, you know, to open up and tell him what he wanted me to, and I didn't. I just figured up a bunch of lies. I thought, well, now look, I went to college, this guy went to college, I took a different course than he did. That's all. I'm just as smart as he is, you know, so nothing happened. Now, that reminds me of a psychiatrist story. <laughs> this fellow was a drunk, like I was, and his family talked him into going to a psychiatrist. So he went to the psychiatrist, and he went for months, and nothing happened. He kept on just getting drunk all the time. So the psychiatrist became just as upset and just as screwy as a patient. So he decided this day when he went to work that he would change his method. He would change his routine on this man. So when John came to see him, he says, John... He says, I'm not having any success with you. I'm going to try a different method altogether. John says, okay, about a half loaded. He says, now what would you do? He says, I want you to answer my questions as honest as you can. John says, fine. And so the psychiatrist says, what would you do if I cut off your left ear? And John says, my hearing would be impaired about 50%. He says, yes, that's right. Now we're getting somewhere. Now he says, what would you do if I cut off your right ear? And John says, well, I wouldn't be able to see and the psychiatrist says, what do you mean you wouldn't be able to see? He says, because my hat would fall down over my eyes. <laughs> Some of you have heard that before. <laughs> well, then... Uh, I was raised in the Roman Catholic Church, and my eldest daughter had asthma, and we moved to Tahunga, California, which is 2,000 altitude, and she was very comfortable up there, never had any trouble. So I'm very lonesome up here. Of course, I can still work down in Hollywood. It's no, not too much of a job. All they have to do is call me when they got a date. But I get very lonesome up there. Of course, now my excuse to drink is lonesomeness. But... Uh, it's rough. And I met this old Catholic priest. He wasn't old then. His name was Father Dennis Falvey. Guess where he was from? An old Irish. Wonderful guy. He needed a choir. So I went down. I put in a lot of time. I helped get a choir together. I helped direct a choir. And, and uh, you know, <laughs> in spurts. I did the very for a couple of weeks. But usually I was around right up with this thing. We became very, very dear friends. He never said boo to me about my drink. He never bawled me out once. I go to him sometimes after a good blast of that red-headed wife of mine who would never let me have a buck when I was dying. Uh, <laughs> I'd have to go to Father and I'd say, Father, loan me $5. Uh, I'm dying, you know. I'd say, please loan me the sweat rolling down and the beard out there here. He couldn't guess what was the trouble. And he'd say, here, my boy. And he says, don't spend it all in one place. He didn't say, why don't you go to church? Why don't you do this? Not, none of that business. He was a very smart man very tolerant man, I must say. So in this particular time, I had a terrible happenstance. Oh, I'll tell you about it. I'll run a little over it. Sure. There, I'll run a little over it. We have a lot of fun anyway. But this is one of the little ding -a things I did. I mean, I don't talk about my history or my drinking or anything, but this is one maybe that will give you an idea <laughs> how a nutty alcoholic can do, you know. I had been sober three months. Everything is fine. I bought a new car. I've got lots of work at the studios. Everything's going along fine. Christmas is coming along. I had two daughters then, and uh, now i got three of them. They're all married. i got eight grandchildren. My God, when they bring them over the house, boy, this is something. <laughs> but uh, I had just two daughters, and uh, for Christmas, we uh, uh, they wanted bicycles. They wanted wristwatches and one thing or another. We're going to have the greatest Christmas we ever had. This is when I was married to the intolerant one, the first wife. I want you to get that straight, because i got a real wife now. <laughs> so, uh, 
We're going to have a real great Christmas. And I'm sober, and I've been rehearsing for this big mass on Christmas morning for the dear old fatter down there. And everything's fine. So uh, about two days before Christmas, I got a call from uh, one of the studios where I worked, did a lot of work, did all their work, in fact. And they said, we're having a big Christmas party the day before Christmas at 3 o'clock on stage so-and-so. All you guys that work here, we'd like to have you come down and give us some dance music. And there's about 40 of you, so 10 of you can play at a time and nobody will be. I said, what else? They says, everybody on the lot will be there. It's all for free. All the booze you want to drink and all the food you want to eat. I says, what kind of booze? Trying to be funny. He says, white horse scotch on down. No champagne. I says, I love white horse scotch, but I'm on the wagon. But I'll be there. So I told this wife of mine about it. She's a good old scout. A little fat now, but anyway, I told her about this, and uh, I'm going out the door with a trombone under my arm about 2 o'clock, start down the hill, and she says, don't drink over two scotch and sodas. And I said, what do you mean, don't drink two scotch and sodas? I'm on a wagon. What do you bring that up for? What are you even reminding me about it for, that they're having scotch and sodas? She says, well, you can take two or three, but you can't take any more. And she says, I know you. I've been married to you for many years. I says, that's just it. You're always bringing up these things. You want me to get drunk, don't you? <laughs> and the big beef starts right there. Ha, ha, ha. One of the excuses right there in my hands. She wants to start an argument. So I go down the hill, and I keep saying to myself, no, I can't drink. I know I can. The poor the first one's the one that always gets me drunk, and I kept saying that to myself. Well, she's been married to me for a good many years, and she ought to know how much I can drink, you know. <laughs> Maybe she knows better than me. And I said, oh, this is crazy thinking. So I went up, and I did my bit with a little band, and I look over at the food bar. All the squares are over there. I look over at the liquor bar. All my pals are over there at the liquor bar. All that booze on top of the bar. White horse scotch on down. A mix, the ice cubes, the whole business. <laughs> And I look over there for a minute, and then I see old Joe. I hadn't seen him for, oh, God knows how long, you know. And I like this guy very much. Maybe I hadn't seen him for a week. I said, Joe, how are you? He says, fine, I'll get up here and dip your beak, Dad. It's all for free, all you want to drink. I says, no, no, I'm on a wagon. He says, it's a hell of a time to go on the wagon with all this good booze. And then somebody else come up that I hadn't seen for a long time. You know what happened? I said, well, I don't care if I do. So I had one. When I got out of jail, New Year, uh, Christmas night, about 9.30, this is jumping a little bit, but the car's all smashed up. I'm in jail all that night and all Christmas day. I, without a doubt, am the most unhappy human being that God put on earth. If they'd have given me a gun, I'd have shot myself. The lawyer even got down there, put her a day late. I said, where were you? He says, well, I was drunk, and I had to sober up, or they'd have put me in with you. <laughs> so I go home, put up the bail, of course. The lawyer put up the bail. I didn't have any dough. And I go home, and uh, the next day I went down to see Father Falvey, and I said, Father, I am going to take the place again. I said, what did you tell him when I didn't show up? And he says, oh, I lied to him. I said, what did you tell him? He says, I told him you were down working on a picture. They had to get it out real quick, and you had to work Christmas. He says, uh, you were in jail, weren't you? And I says, yeah. He says, well, I guessed it. But he says, I lied to him and just told him that you were down there. I said, well, I guess I'd better take the pledge. He says, what do you mean? The pledge not to drink? And I said, yeah. And he says, oh, you can take it if you want it, but it won't do you any good. I said, what do you mean it won't do me any good? I'm just as smart as these other people. I got just as much faith as he said, oh, that's all fine, but you're, you're a drunk. He says, I can't describe it, but you're, you're one of those guys. And he says, I'm, I've known a lot of guys like you in my lifetime. And I says, well, well what's going to happen to me? He says, I don't know. You're just going to die a drunk. That's about the only thing I can tell you, unless something happens along the way. I says, do you know any guys like me that ever got sober? And he says, yes, a couple. I said, how? He says, I don't know. But I do know one thing. that something happened to them where they had a complete change of attitudes. They had a complete change of personality. And he says, they never took another drink, and they were wonderful people. I says, well, what made him have this change of attitudes and the change of personality? This is way back in 1936. He says, I don't know. I wish I did. He says, I don't know where they are. Or I tell you. Well, I says, I'll be darned. I says, what's going to happen to me? He says, I don't know. I just hope to God that something happens to you where you have this complete change of attitude and complete change of personality. 
He didn't say, you, you're, you're a sinner. Well, this is another thing I asked him. He said, uh, it's not a sin to drink, but it's a sin to be a drunk. And that's as far as I can take you. He never had any idea that it was a moral vice to drink, which it isn't. If, you're, if it's normal for you, 96% of the people can drink and don't have a bit of trouble. But he said, you have to have a change of attitude. You have to have a change of personality. When I came into my first meeting in Alcoholics Anonymous in 1941, that's the first thing I heard. And here this father was telling me that way back in 1936. But how? A.A. had the how. You see, he didn't have the how at all. By this time, I'm living in a $2 a week room. Things are real rough. All my friends have left me. My family doesn't write to me anymore. I went through the whole thing like a lot of the rest of you did. A lot of you guys still got your wives and your bank accounts and your, and your jobs. You were just that much better off. But God bless you for getting into AA before you went as far as I did. It was up here. I could take care of the physical sickness. But this up here, this remorse, this something, this is killing me. I couldn't take that. That was awful. Just fighting, fighting, fighting every minute of the day. Keep away from that first drink. It just don't work out. This willpower won't do it for you. It's like telling the TV not to cough. His willpower will stop him from coughing. That's about as sensible it is to talk. Tell an alcoholic not to take that first drink. It's terrible. It's awful. So the last time I got out of jail for drunk driving, they said I was parked and passed out behind the wheel. Ha, ha, ha. Twice I was drunk driving. I wasn't even driving. Hell, I was passed out. <laughs> Laying over the wheel with the horn blowing. They don't like this. Keeps me away. And the motor running. So I did a little time down there for Biscalous, the sheriff. And I swore to God that if I ever took another drink and I got drunk, I was going to keep right on drinking until I died. I was never going to get sober again. I was going to kill myself drinking. Well, something came up after about eight weeks after I was out of that pokey and I started it. And unfortunately, I had charge accounts at a lot of bars. In a studio, man, I'd always make it in big bunches and then I'd go pay all those bills off first, you see. Ha, ha, ha. And then the other ones would come afterwards. I always wanted to have that ace in the hole where I could drink. This drunk was the worst I've ever been on in my life, like all the last drunks were. They'd get progressively worse. I was passed out by noon every day. Started sleeping with my clothes on. The whole routine, no food, no nothing. My girlfriend, who is now my wife, uh, tried to feed me. I wouldn't have anything to do with anybody. While I was on this bender, my old friend Jack called me up. And I was able to stagger to the phone, and he said, Hey, he said, have you seen the Saturday Evening Post this week? And I said, how could I see the Saturday Evening Post this week? Well, he says, I read about a group of people in New York called Alcoholics Anonymous. I said, what about them? He says, I don't know. I'm drunk, and I can't. My eyes won't focus worth a damn. But he says, I see a picture of a guy looking at a guy lying in bed. And he says, most likely this guy's brought him some booze. And he says, one drunk helps another, just like you and I used to do. Exactly. I says, no kidding. And he says, yeah. And he says, this guy is lying in bed. And he says, as well, I get it, and all I can read, he said, when that guy is well and this other fellow needs a jug, he goes and helps him. <laughs> and he says, they've always got another guy to help them off these bad drunks. And he says, there's a hundred of them in this state. It's like a daisy chain. They're always helping one another. <laughs> I says, my God, I didn't know there was such a thing in the world. And he says, yep, it's right here in the Saturday Evening Post. This was the first week of March of 1941. So I said, well, I'll have, to, I'll have to get the magazine. And I got down to the corner and got the magazine without getting pinched. And <clears throat> I couldn't read it. In fact, I wasn't even using glasses to read with them. So I threw it aside. And a few weeks later, I got another call from Jack. He says, I found this thing called Alcoholics Anonymous. I said, no. He said, yeah. I says, how did you find it? He says, I was down to the liquor store cuffing for a jug of wine, and one of the local drunks came in there and paid part of his bill. He says, I immediately got him by the arm, took him outside, and said, look, you're going to spoil it for us guys got no dough by paying this bill. I said, oh. <laughs> and the guy says, look, he says, I joined a group of people called Alcoholics Anonymous, and one of the things that we do to make things right and change our attitude and so forth is to pay our bills and, and make amends. And he says, I got a little money, I'm spreading it very thin around the neighborhood. So he said, the guy, he said, I went to a meeting with a guy, and he says, I've been, uh, I've been sober a week. He says, they stay sober. Oh, I says, no. He said, yeah, I've been sober a week. I says, Jack, if you've been sober a week, I'm a cinch for a lifetime, because you're the most low-type drinker I ever met in my life. 
So he says, send the guy over and I'll give him an audience. <laughs> and he says, no, you have to call him yourself. And that's a good thing, too. So I call him myself. And he says, I'll be over tomorrow afternoon. I says, don't you come over afternoon, because I'll be passed out by 12 noon. <laughs> he says, given orders yet. I says, I'm just telling you, you don't know who I am. I'm possibly one of the greatest trombone players that ever walked this earth. And if I join your club, I'm sure adding a lot of prestige to it. Now, you get over here before noon tomorrow. The damn fool wouldn't believe me. He came in the afternoon, and I was passed out. And this goes on for days. He never gets over there in the morning. So finally, he told the landlady, he says, when this guy gets sober for a couple of days, tell him to call me. And finally, I, through, I, I got sober enough so I could call him. I says, okay. He says, Wednesday night, I'll be there. I said, okay. So he came over. He talked to me for two hours, and it was just a lot of blah, 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 blah. I, I couldn't get it at all. I didn't like the guy anyway. I asked him questions he couldn't answer. So he says, we're meeting at, on 6th Street at so-and-so address. She says, I'll pick you up Friday night. We have one meeting a week in Los Angeles. I said, don't bother. I haven't decided to join your club yet. I'll put this, I'll think this over, and uh, I'll be down if I want. So I asked Celia, my girlfriend, I says, let's go down and look it over. She said, fine. So we drove down. Well... <clears throat> The guy was up there, he was quoting from the Bible and giving us a lot of the, that yak. I've been all through this. This didn't get me sober, see? So I turned to the guy sitting next to me, and I said, this is like the Main Street mission down there. All I need is sawdust on the floor, and we're right down on Main Street at one of those missions. I'm going home, and here I am dictating already, and I'm shaking like an aspen leaf in the wind. I got a, I got a just flown out of the window. I was shaking so bad. He says, are you an alcoholic? And I said, yeah. He says, you stay for the rest of this meeting and come back to at least eight meetings and then decide whether you think this is for you or not. He says, this guy up in front is just like a preacher I've met. But he said, we have different speakers every Friday night and you'll learn something. And these, all these guys around here are drunks. And I said, ah, they can't be drunks. They've got ties off. They've got their wristwatches and stuff. They can't be drunk. He says, yes, they are. And they're a lot worse than you, most likely. So I said, I'll just prove to you that this thing doesn't work. So I stayed. And I come back the next Friday. And I come back the next Friday. And I don't know why, but I'm staying sober. And I'm getting acquainted with these guys, and they're nice fellows. Not even musicians they are, but they're nice guys anyway. <laughs> and I think it's the first time I ever associated with a bunch of guys that weren't musicians. And I find out that people make livings in different walks of life, and it seems to be exciting to them. Nothing could be exciting to me but music. And then the leader of the group, his name was Frank Rattle at that time, he used to get up and he'd just practically spit in your face, you know. If you don't want to stay sober on an all-time basis, get the hell out of here and all that stuff. And so I went up to him one day and I said, you make me so mad, I'm never coming back here again. I says, I couldn't stand the insults that you throw at us. And he reared back and he laughed and he says, but you're thinking, aren't you? <laughs> but you're thinking, aren't you? I says, yeah. Well, he says, get as mad as you want to, but just keep thinking and you won't get drunk. Ha, ha, ha. You know, I'll never forget that. I know a lot of guys that I talk to, newcomers, that I say things that I maybe hurt their feelings and makes them mad, but by God, they stay sober. They're starting to think again, you see. Well, anyway, after about six months of this, and I'm not getting any work, and they, I'm supposed to be getting that alimony to my ex-wife, which she isn't getting, and, and the sheriff's assistant coming down and say, get the alimony to your wife, or we'll put you on a county road building project, you know, all those things. Well, there's a lot of guys on that that aren't paying alimony. So I went to the same Frank Randall and I said, uh, Frank, do you know anybody in the music business? He said, no, why? I said, I need a job real bad. And I thought you might have an angle. He says, my boy, this is not an employment agency. This is a place to stay sober. He says, now, what's your number one problem? Well, I said, alcohol is my number one problem. He says, okay, take care of your number one problem and everything else will take care of itself when it's supposed to. He says, you might not get a job for five years the way you kick these people around, but you'll eat and you'll have a roof over your head. And he says, from now on until you're six foot under, worry about one thing, your number one problem. That's all you have to worry about, and everything else will come out just fine. And he says, you got the road map. He says, there's the book of the 12 steps. He says, live. That's all you have to do. Even to this day, I never forget that. Every day this comes into my mind. I haven't done any problems. I may think that some problem is real, real rough. I'm in the selling business now. I sell big businesses. They're getting big now. They weren't, ha, ha, ha. They weren't for a hell of a long time. But uh, 
you know, you, you work, you head off at a deal maybe for one month, two months, three months. It means a lot of money to you, and it falls flat on its face. And I don't care who you are. There's always a certain amount of that let down. Oh, God. How hard I worked on this deal. You start feeling sorry for yourself. You start going through this old alcoholic thinking. But if you jack yourself up and say, Jesus, I haven't got any problems. I just got one problem. I got enough to put hamburger on the table for a while. I got enough to pay my bills for a while. This is supposed to be this way. And invariably, it is this way. I had a guy come into my office about three months ago who I had done a favor for about three years ago. It cost me a lot of money. I didn't feel too good about it either at that time. And I hadn't seen this guy for three years. And he says, you remember three years ago you did me a favor? You spent a lot of money on advertising a certain property that I had and all this. And I said, yeah, I remember that very well. Your name is Jack. He says, yeah. I said, remember for a while. Well, he says, I'm going to make that up to you. And I said, well, I, look, I'm not asking for any favors. That's all in the business. It's like shooting crap in this business. You might make it, you might not. But he says, I have never forgotten what you did. And he come up and he had a friend of his who wanted to buy a certain motel, or a motel, and I got the motel for him, and I made more money than I ever did on a deal in all my life. Just because I had done this for this guy. But at the time, I had spent this quite a bit of money on him, and had made a thing, and I started feeling sorry for myself. But here, three years later, this whole thing come back to me, not tenfold, but at least twenty or thirtyfold. It just goes down the line. I know one thing, that if you and I do the best we can, with all the honesty that we can muster and follow the prescription that they gave us in Alcoholics Anonymous that everything has to come out just right. Eventually. not Maybe not immediately, but eventually. It will all come out just exactly right. There's nothing that we can do about the physical, but the mental can be taken care of. The change of attitudes, the change of personality which is nothing more than good practicability, good down-to-earth living. And as one guy I heard say, the very practicability of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous is spirituality identified. The practical man is the spiritual man. That is the man who does what he's supposed to do when he's supposed to do it. It's very simple. It's very simple. And we know. Now you take the program of Alcoholics Anonymous the first three steps are decisions, and I'll tell you when the bell rang for me on the fourth step. <coughs> Taking the inventory. Now, it might sound strange to some, but to me, this is just what the doctor ordered. I mean, I took the first three steps, and of course, take them. What the hell we live in the rest of our life? We have to keep practicing them the rest of our life. But I got to thinking about this, and I know that alcoholism is not a moral vice. It is not a sin to drink. I must have defects of character that have gotten clear out of bounds which cause me to become uh, emotionally uncomfortable to the point where I have to drink. Now, that's my theory. It works real good for me. It's down to earth and it's sensible. So I thought of it this way. What causes me to get myself into these big emotional tizzies? It must be a defect of character. What is the worst? With me, it is... Frustration or self-pity is the worst defect of character or the worst fault that I have. Still have it. Always will as long as I live. But it is much better because I recognize it and honestly recognize it in my daily life when it comes up. So I wrote this down, a written inventory, which is 100% more powerful than what we call the mental inventory. In the old days, we all wrote our inventory. We compared them. We talked them over in a good, sensible manner. Nowadays, very few take it. And I think we're just not getting the most out of the program, and we don't. Then the second worst defective character that I have is resentment. And the third is intolerance. And the fourth is selfishness. And the fifth is anger. And right on down the line. And I still have my inventory that I took first. I just added to it. On the other side of the ledger, the only thing that I had was the fact that I thought I had my health. I had one good friend in the world, and that was my girlfriend, who married me after two years after I got sober. And this is about all I had to go on. But look, by my writing these things down and looking at myself as I actually was, was well, the biggest victory I ever had over Marino in my life. Now, the next one was admitted to God and to another human being. Oh, I admitted to God. I says, God, here you are. But to admit to another being, a human being, this is another thing. 
this is something that's kind of rough. And my goodness, do I have to go to another guy and say, I found out that I'm full of self-pity? Now I don't mind. See, I got maybe a little humility now, not much, but a lot more than I have. Do I have to go to another guy and say, I'm a frustrated guy, that I'm, I'm full of self-pity, that I'm, I'm intolerant, that I'm resentful, that I'm selfish? Well, that's what the man said in the book. If I want to stay sober, I'd better go 100%. So I happened to be with a friend of mine one day, and I pulled this thing out of my pocket, and I says, here it is. I took my inventory, Pete. Let's talk it over. He says, fine. I took mine, too, and here's mine. Let's sit down and have a talk about it. For two hours, I had the most sensible talk with another human being that I ever had in all my life. Now, this is a great victory. But it was very difficult for me to take this step. I have to have a change of attitudes, which is a change in thinking. And if I'm going to have that change in thinking, I have to do things that are not so comfortable for me to do, that are very distasteful, or I'm not going to have a change in thinking. Something happened on these two steps. And I know what it was. I had to have humility, which is something I never had in my life. I thought the humble guys were the guys who kicked around. I thought they were the yes man, like around the studios you see so often. The assistant director, all you ever happen to hear him say is, yes, 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 yes. The director says something, he says, yes, yes. There was a guy standing on the corner of Hollywood and Vine one day, and he was standing up there and shaking his head and saying, no, 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 no. And the cop says, come up to him and says, what's the matter with you? He says, I'm a, an assistant director on vacation. <laughs> but that's what I thought about. And then when you stop to think, the greatest people in the world were also the most humble. And this is something we have to have, some humility, or we're not going to get sober. Jesus Christ, the image of humility. Abraham Lincoln, humility. George Washington, humility. Einstein, humility. You can just go on and on and on. Any great man that you could name was also a very humble man. And here I am, a good-for-nothing lush, trying to be a big shot. And then we get down to the step on, on making, making amends. This is a real tough one for me. I don't know about you. So I did. It's quite a story. I'm running out of time, but I mean, I went around and made amends personally. And oh God, this is a hard job for me. The worst thing first, the worst ones first, the ones that bothered me the most, and then the one on taking a daily inventory. It's not a daily inventory with me. It's an inventory every day. It's an inventory every hour, because I still have this thing. These demons arise like self pity, resentment, intolerance selfishness, and all the rest of them, they still arise in my daily life. And it's a strange thing how fast we can recognize them if we're honest. If we're honest. And the twelfth step, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. Now many of us think that the spiritual awakening is the flashing of lights and the ringing of bells. No, 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 no. Read Appendix 2 of the big book. Bill explains that the spiritual awakening is the change of attitudes and the change of personality exactly what we're talking about. That is the spiritual awakening. Once in a great while you find a man who has a spiritual awakening overnight, but this is the exception to the rule. It's a change. It's a growth. It's something that happens to you or me, makes better people out of us, and makes us much happier. And I found out in this program of Alcoholics Anonymous that if I did the steps and worked the steps the hardest, the ones that I disliked the most, it was going to do me the most good. So the first, second, and third were difficult. From the four bar, the taking of the daily, in, the taking of the inventory, the talking the inventory over with another human being, the making amends, the admitting I was wrong, and the tall step. These are the ones that did me the most good. The ones that I dislike to do the most. How am I going to have a change of attitudes? How am I going to have a change of personality? How am I going to have a change in my thinking unless I do things that I dislike to do? So here it is, laid out for. And you know, this is about most important. Now you take the 12 step. I think I can work the 12 step and help my fellow suffering alcoholic better by number one, staying sober as a living example that this program works and by two, attending meetings. Attending meetings is as important to me as the insulin shots is to the man who has diabetes. We don't get any diplomas in Alcoholics Anonymous. This is an all-time job. I will give you instance after instance of people who are sober 16 and 17 and 18 years. One of them just died. Hadn't been to a meeting for five years. One of them is in San Quentin for life. 
hadn't been to a meeting for six years. Why? Because her thinking went right back home again blue. This is just as important to me as the man with, with diabetes and is taking his insulin, these meetings, of utmost importance. This is group therapy. This is just as important as any other part of AA, maybe more important. I go to a meeting every Thursday night with my own group down there. Because I've seen these other old pals of mine just fall by the wayside. They don't, not all of them, but a few of them. And if I can uh, profit by their mistakes, I'm going to do it. And I say the third best way for me to work the 12-step is by actually going out and helping that man who wants help. Not the slipper, but the guy who is there already, who really wants AA. I can't help the slipper at all, because he knows as much about AA as I do. All I can do is hold his head while he pukes. And I don't like to do that. I did a lot of it. I might puke on you. <laughs> so here I am. The best years of my life I've been sober. Thank God, an alcoholic anonymous, because God gave us AA. God is all and all is God. And when God appointed a guy by the name of Bill Wilson, he knew just who he was appointing. And Bill carried on. God's behind everything. Everything I do in my life, the plan is laid out, I believe. Maybe I'm a fatalist. But I think everything that happens to me happens for the best. If I take care of my part of the job, God will take care of the rest. I know that. So here I am, 20 years, 121 years now sober. Everything I have in the world, I owe to Alcoholics Anonymous. Serenity, peace of mind, certain amount of humility, all of these things, not 100%. Anytime a guy puts you on cloud 99 and says everything's going to be ice cream and roses because you're sober, they're nuts. They're just lying because they don't know. But it's going to be so much better than what you're used to that you just can't believe it. But we're just human beings. That's all we are. We're just human beings. And we will still have our headaches and our heartaches. But we have to surmount these things without getting drunk and getting ourselves into a big stew. This is the answer to our problem. This is everything to us in this world if we want to live. I would say a normal life, no, much better than a normal life. Because we've been through the hell, now we can really enjoy it on the other side. The thousands of friends that I have in the world, I owe to Alcoholics Anonymous. The wonderful help that I have. Everything, my very life, my sanity, I owe to Alcoholics Anonymous. And you are Alcoholics Anonymous, and I want to thank all of you for everything I have in this world. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.